if we want to really spread our philosophy, we need to make this done through the literary work. Um, without going into a lot of stories of book distribution, we, we know from the history that uh, many, many of us sitting here have become Krishna conscious, or actually began Krishna conscious, because we got a book, or we read a book, or we met a book distributor, or something. Um, books are so foundational, both in our practice of Krishna consciousness, the philosophy, the understanding, connects us with Krishna and the Acharyas, and gives us a clearer understanding of how to practice Krishna consciousness. Not only a clear, but a clear understanding. It also, the written word is very powerful, is that um, it, one can absorb it, meditate on it, think about it, and go deeper into the written word. So Prabhupada understood that this is the best way to make people aware of what we have to offer is book distribution. So in 1973, things really started to begin in our movement. Before we were just doing back to Godhead magazines. And then gradually the idea became in with big books. No one thought that anyone would buy these Bhagavad Gita's or Srimad Bhagavatams on the street. But a few very, what we say, uh, adventurous devotees decided to try it. And when they tried it, they got the most amazing results. In fact, when the results started to come, book distribution became a fever. That there were many book distributors that would go out from morning to night, just distributing books, Prabhupada's books. And gradually this started to build, and then in the year 1974, I think we distributed over 2 million books or even more. And then Prabhupada said double it, and then the next year we did to something like 4 million books. So the actual total that's recorded to today is that the United the Iskand Society have distributed over a half a billion Prabhupada's books. And that's what's recorded. Five hundred and eleven million books. Five hundred no was it yeah, five hundred and eleven million, which is more than a half a billion books. So flooding the world with books means bringing people to Krishna consciousness. There are so many stories. And so just recently, one of the most prominent book distributors in our movement, his name is Vaisheshika, has written a book called Our Family Business, <laughs> which is the history of book distribution in ISKCON, along with the principles that surround book distribution and many wonderful stories. <coughs> There's, there's reviews by at least 15 senior devotees. I'll just read one, and let me just to give you. In our family business, Vaisheshika Prabhu has brilliantly captured the spirit that drove Srila Prabhupada's disciples beyond all limits to please his divine grace by publishing and distributing his books by the millions all over the world. Reader, beware. This book has the potential to not only to rekindle the same spirit in the hearts of those who live only to elicit Srila Prabhupada's smile, but to ignite that same spirit in the hearts of those who are not even aware that that's what this life is all about. And that's written by Narendra Maharaj. Jai Dvaita Maharaj, Gopal Krishna Maharaj, Narendra Maharaj, Radha Swami, Shiva Ram Maharaj. The list goes on, everyone. Jai Pataka Maharaj, Giri Swami, uh, Indra Jumama, Devamrita Maharaj, Kalakanta Prabhu, Naveen Krishna, all gave their endorsement in the most amazing way. Uh, I can't stop reading the book. <laughs> it's, not, it's electrical. Because Vaisheshi Prabhu has given his life to book distribution. You know, he's an innovator in how to 
think of new and more creative ways to bring people to Krishna consciousness through Bhaktis generation. So I recommend the devotees to read this, but the ILS ISKCON leadership has set an initiative this year to get each and every devotee in the entire ISKCON society to distribute books. So I'm going to offer that initiate, initiative to all of you. <laughs> and it's called ISKCON's 50-50 Campaign. <laughs> and what that is, is that we're asking each and every devotee in the ISKCON movement to distribute 50 books this year. Prabhupada's books. Join us in making a personal offer to distribute 50 books in the year 2016. Uh, you can contact your local temple and ask how you can take part in it. You can get buy books yourself and just distribute them. They have these uh, different score sheets where you can actually record the books you distribute and then turn it into the temple and you'll be recognized as a person who fulfilled the 50-50 merit mission. So I'm encouraging all devotees to somehow or other do book distribution at least this year. So 50 books if you look at it from the beginning of January, 26 weeks in the year, that's, uh, that's an average of about two books a week. We've lost a few weeks. So we're down to about 40 weeks now, something like that. So 50 books in 40 weeks. Prabhupada's books. Not just... We, I mean, we have so many other books written by Prabhupada's disciples. We want to distribute you on Prabhupada's books. Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, Nectar Devotion. And if you just think of ways to do it, Krishna will give you so many ideas on how you can get books to people in general. We have one of the top book distributors here in the whole, not one of the top, the top book distributor in the UK sitting right here in the front row. Every year she's number one book distributor. I, her scores are phenomenal. <laughs> And uh, she outdoes all the men. <laughs> She's a, we might say, a lady that has a lot of other responsibilities in her life. But she's made book distribution her life and so on. If you talk to her, you can, you'll see how much she's brimming over with that enthusiasm that comes to pleasing Srila Prabhupada by distributing his books. And as Naranjan Swami says, when you distribute a book, Prabhupada smiles. <laughs> so to get Prabhupada smile, it's not very hard. <laughs> so I'm encouraging, strongly encouraging all devotees to this, how we can make this a little bit more available. I only have one copy, but it tells you a little bit how you can approach it. Uh, you can do it through a temple, you can just buy the books yourself, or you can get someone else to sponsor the books and then distribute the books like that. So you, that's called Shastradhan. For someone else to sponsor the books and then you can hand it out. You don't have to sell them, you can hand it out to people who you think would very much appreciate and read the books. So if every devotee in the entire ISKCON society distributes 50 books, how many books that one? You can't begin to calculate how what the numbers of what would be. That would be millions because there's so many devotees in our movement in temples and outside of temples. So this is for everyone. Please don't consider yourself unfit. We become unfit when we say, I can't do it. <laughs> so everyone take the initiative and uh, Get some books, and if you can pace yourself, you can do one or two a week or even more. Now, 50 is not the maximum. <laughs> that's the minimum. And if you can do more, that's even more glorious. But just to inspire devotees to get involved in book distribution, this initiative of 50-50, this is the 50th year of the anniversary of our movement, Srila Prabhupada incorporated the International Society for Krishna Consciousness 
on July 13th, 1966. So this, um, the, on that day, July 13th, there will be many celebrations all around the world to uh, celebrate 50 years of our movement like that. So this is the year. What happened on 13 July 1966? You were born. No, you were not either. <laughs> what year was that? 63. She was born on July 13th. <laughs> 66, Prabhupada incorporated the ISKCON Society. And he actually made it a, what we say, incorporated uh, organization. Can we put it on, on the conference? Yeah, yeah. Maybe we can I can give you that. We can put it on the conference. And I would highly suggest, there's also, uh, there's this little bookmark that came <coughs> with that, and it has the websites and that you can actually order this book, Our Family Business. It's a most amazing expression of devotion, along with the history of uh, books in our movement. You can also take this and put the uh, website somewhere. Mm -hmm. You can order the book. Like I think it might also be available here within the book outlets and, and around the manor. I'm not sure. I haven't seen it. But it'll, if it hasn't, it'll eventually get to it. Okay. Anything on book distribution? Anybody would, would like to offer some statements? Thank you. There's so much we can say, but uh, we cannot calculate the, when we speak about doing good to others, uh, we speak about giving them knowledge. When people have knowledge, they have something, what we say, solid. Welfare work done in the material world is more or less patchwork on a person's temporary suffering. But when a person receives transcendental knowledge, that knowledge can be the foundation for solving all their problems in life. So there's no greater form of welfare work than to give persons an opportunity to understand how they can solve all their problems. And Prabhupada's books are the foundation for both spiritual understanding and what we might say material stability in life. So can I glorify the books enough? Any questions or comments on book distribution? Okay. No questions. Okay. Is it uh, regarding this 50 50 rule, uh, is it also just by giving the books like as a present or just by selling it to somebody? Uh, if someone sponsors the books, then you can give the books. But somehow there has to be some financial exchange. You just can't just hand out the books. You know, you, there is a program, it's called Shastradan. Shastradan means someone comes forward and gives a large donation, and the money is used to purchase books, and the books are distributed like that. But if that is not there, then the person distributing books should get should get some, you know, reciprocation for the knowledge, for the gift. I'm just Who's Johnny Keen out there? Is he here? You want to say something about you know book distribution? About your own experience on book distribution. In terms of you know how. We understand, you know, the question was, so we just give out books? Yeah, on the streets, Marge, when we, when we give out books, we tell people that uh, one of the reasons why we ask for money when we give books is that it gives them the qualification to understand and realize the book. So, so when people actually give money, it actually gives them the ability to understand and realize. And so by paying for it, we communicate to them that this qualifies you to get a better understanding. Because so. you're reciprocating with the gift. Yes, and then also they get back to it. Prabhupada didn't yes. like giveaways because he said, you know, our books have substance. Therefore, when people pay for it, they actually will read it 
as opposed to when you give it them, they might just say, oh, that's really nice to put on the shelf. Or, yeah. The value is more appreciated when there is a reciprocation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anything else on book distribution? Yes. Since it's done, we have all the books here. In uh, Switzerland, yeah. how does that work? Well, they put uh, some together, or you can go to each one you want, and then you pay for it, and then you, know, you go and you can it. Oh, so you, take, you pay for the books, and you, the temple supplies you books, and you pay for it, and then you go out and distribute it. Yeah. So you pay cost price, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's nice. That's a nice program. There's so many ways to distribute books, and that's one of them. The temples, and you can find you know, book distribution websites where they give them insights on how to you know, distribute Prabhupada's books. I mean, some of us are by nature not very, what we say, we're a little shy to approach people we don't know. So it's a little hard, but if you try it, you'll see you can do it. <laughs> because you have the material. Uh, see, the thing is that people want these books. They're looking for this knowledge. Although they may not consciously be aware of it, they're looking for something to make their lives you know, better or actually get away from their present suffering. So this knowledge is, is a treasure house. This is what they're looking for. It teaches them, you know, you are something different than who you think you are, and your goal in life is much different than what you think is actual success. In other words, it brings them to the right understanding of the purpose of life and their true identity. And then because of that, they don't have that, they suffer. If you don't know who you are, you don't know why you're doing what you're doing or where you're going, or if you have the wrong understanding of that, all you get is disappointment, suffering, and reverses in life. And even if you're successful materially, what is the value? You lose it anyway. It doesn't, doesn't, give, you, doesn't give you happiness. Material things cannot give you happiness. So we were, we were teaching people that through these books. So book distribution is the greatest welfare work in the world. How many of you here actually became devotees because of a book? A few. Yeah, so that's a good percentage, at least one third. And books are very valuable. Okay, so I want to bring that up first because I thought that was the most important part of this discussion with book distribution. Mm -hmm. um, I'm more of a uh, practical level, spiritual practical. I wanted to encourage devotees because we were discussing in this um, in these seminars that I think Buddha Bhavana summed up what both of us said in a very nice way is that when you look at Krishna consciousness and you have to look at where can you put your emphasis in order to make accelerate your spiritual growth there are two things one is attentive chanting that remains one of the foremost, one of the foremost things to accelerate your spiritual life. To bring your chanting more and more attentively. And the other thing was, of course, is the other side of loyal offenses. But going back to attentive chanting, and this is, it's actually in relationship to what Prabhupada said regarding chanting. He basically said, 
he said 10 or 16 rounds a day. But when you read his, his, his instructions in a more detailed way, you'll find he said, the earlier the better. And my experience is that chant your 16 rounds as early as possible. And even if you can't see how to do it, do it anyway. <laughs> in other words, if you start, if you get up in the morning and you can make enough time and chant 16 rounds without you doing anything else, you'll see a very qualitative increase in your spiritual life, strongly. It becomes very, very clear you're actually making spiritual advancement. Why? Because the Holy Name is the means for all advancement, but at the same time, when you put it first, it lays the foundation for everything you do throughout the day. When you're equipped with that shakti that comes with early chanting, the whole day becomes more or less easily and more, what we say, I don't know, challenges, obstacles become challenges, and things that are routine become just forms of pleasure. In other words, you're, you're more equipped to deal with the things throughout the day, and you have a clear vision on how to organize your life. The Holy Name is everything. It's everything. So if we can chant our rounds early, and I know one spiritual master who's made it an instruction for all his disciples, 16 rounds before you do anything. I know many of us have work, we also have families, and there's children involved in some cases. But as much as you can, what we say, develop a program of early chanting, you'll see your spiritual life will change qualitatively a lot. It's not a small thing. And in those, because the early morning hours also give us the quietness of the day where we can uh, push aside all the activities that are about to come and just focus on the Holy Name. As the day goes on, the modes of passion and ignorance start to become more prominent. And activity is more natural. So when we try to squeeze in our rounds at different times of the day, we might do that, but it's not, it doesn't have the same, what we say, effect on our overall consciousness. If we could sit and just focus, it might be difficult, the mind is a little restless, work on that. But if you work on that day after day, early rounds, you'll see your spiritual life will grow nicely. And I think a lot of times the problems we have in our Krishna consciousness and I'm not saying some of the problems, all of the problems are pretty much due to the fact that we're not chanting either attentively or we have the, we're trying to get our rounds done, we just don't have time, we squeeze them in over here. Uh, it eliminates, uh, and I'll mention the, the person, it was Naranjan Maharaj, we were talking, he was, he was telling us the boys were coming to me and telling me about this problem, that problem, this situation, that situation. So I was hearing a lot of this, and he said, I decided for one year I'd only speak on the Holy Name, every class. And he said, I did it. Every class I gave for one full year was just about the glories and the practice of the Holy Name. He said, after that one year, the amount of complaints and people coming to visit decreased more than half. Yeah, because this is really our problem. It's really the problem is our chanting. It's either we can we need to elevate the quality of our chanting. And it takes a little effort. It takes a lot of effort. When you first start to make an effort, it becomes a little difficult. Once you get into the routine, then it becomes natural and you actually start to look forward to it. And uh, even during, during this seminar, I don't want to 
I was trying to put my rounds first. And we were going to the kirtans at night and having to come here and give me class in the morning. But I was always getting my at least 16 rounds done or at least 14 rounds before I did anything. And I can't function like that. Sometimes, I was just talking to one person this morning, I said, how many rounds did you have? He said, three. I said, if I had three rounds at this time of the day, I wouldn't be able to talk to anybody. <laughs> I can't function. <laughs> Unless I get, if I get, I have the satisfaction and the happiness of sitting down and just chanting my rounds. And that's our process. That's our process. So if we we're actually want to make tangible spiritual practice, here's where we have to focus on Krishna's holy name as the foundation and early job. And Prabhupada also said something really interesting. He said, if you haven't finished your 16 rounds, you should know that at any moment you can be victimized by Maya. Just by completing those 16 rounds, you actually completed the vow to your spiritual master. Because at the time of initiation, we say, yes, I will chant 16 rounds. So when that is completed, that vow is, it's, you know, you, you actually fulfill that vow for that day. Then you're protected by the mercy of the spiritual master. So it's so important that we chant our rounds nicely and early. This is important early. Yes, Michelle. I have one question. Thank you very much. Um, I want to ask you how to chant uh, if we are sick. Maybe we are a few days uh, disabled to chant 60 pounds. And should we uh, chant the days after this uh, rounds which uh, we are missing? We're too, we're too sick to chant? Well, you, and that would take away from your chanting, even if you're sick. You can, maybe you don't have the energy to chant, but you can also chant silently, chant in your mind, or you can, you know, some way you can stay in contact with the Holy Name, even if you're sick. I mean, sometimes it takes, it takes some energy to chant, but if we don't have the energy because we're sick, we chant softly or quietly, or chant in your mind. You can practice that. Chant or chant by looking at the mantra. It's an, I think we can do it even if we're sick. If you get too sick, if you get unconscious, then you're going to just play a tape with the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But there's always some practical solutions that we can, you know, divert to. And, and when things are not... But if you miss your rounds for one, for whatever reason, the, the standard is we have to make them up. They're not optional. Prabhupada said, so if you haven't chanted at your 16, haven't finished, you have to finish the next day. He didn't say the next day after that. He said the next day. So if you finish only 12 rounds one day, the next day you have to chant 20. I mean, is it that hard? Prabhupada <laughs> said, Vishwamitra Muni immersed himself in ice cold water up to his neck in the winter time. And in the summertime, sat around with oh, seven hot fires around him in the middle of the summer and did meditation. And I'm asking you to chant 16 rounds and you can't do that. No, that's the task. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> we're not like Vishwan, we, do, we don't have to do that. But is it that much of an austerity to chant the holy name and to make it a, like the foremost of activity? And, we perform every day. It's just a matter of, I think, of prioritizing our life. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, sometimes rare occasions, one is just so 
overwhelmed with the number of things that one has to do. There's so much going on, there's so much service, something. And you cannot chant your 16 rounds for that. Is it like that every day? No. <laughs> Doesn't have to be like that. Once in a while we call it emergency and things that can be adjusted. But that's not the standard. Right. If we make that the standard, then we don't really understand the importance of chanting. The glories of the holy name and the benefits that come by way of chanting cannot be calculated. If you're chanting the holy name, there's nothing that can harm you. Nothing. You're completely protected against everything. That's the power of Krishna's name. It's all powerful because it's Krishna himself and sound. So we've been given 16 rounds, which is quite minimal <coughs> compared to our tradition, where Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, his devotees were asked to chant 32 rounds if they were living in the Mat. They were living outside, they, he gave them less. But they were living inside the Mat 30, no, I'm sorry, 64 rounds. 64 rounds. Of and Prabhupada also asked us to chant 64 rounds when he began the movement. But the devotees protested and gave reasons, and the Prabhupada accepted and reduced it down to 16. But then he said, no less. But then he writes, 16 good rounds. So what makes something good? Our efforts to make it good. That's it. Good doesn't automatically manifest, but we're trying to qualify, we're trying to put quality in our chanting. And there's prayers we can offer that will increase the mercy that comes by way of chanting. And you can pray to the Holy Name, you can pray to your beads, you can pray to Lord Chaitanya, you can pray to Krishna, you can pray to your spiritual master. Pray to Prabhupada. All these prayers are indications of our eagerness to increase the quality of our chanting, increase the devotion that we use in our chanting. Prayer is very, very powerful. So I just want to emphasize the importance of early japa. So my humble suggestion is please try to live in such a way as you get you finish your rounds early in other words make that more and more priority in your life and that may require some adjustment but in your schedules but if you can work on it you'll see the benefit it's it's tremendous it's tremendous not only 16 rounds but early rounds right dharma you know that you live experiencing that Okay. All right, so um, there's only one more thing, and then we'll show the video. Um, anything on chanting? Yeah. My question is many times we go to some job like this or something, and we get very inspired. Yeah, that's that's natural. Not natural, it's just human, you might say. Inspiration comes by association and hearing and various types of programs that inspire us, and then we go back to our routines. The inspiration drives gradually. Therefore we need to take association regularly. To keep that inspiration alive. That's why that's why hearing regularly is a, is a feature of our success in Krishna consciousness. We have to hear. How many devotees listen to Prabhupada every day? Ooh, that's not good. Prabhupada is the foundation for everything we do and everything we practice, everything we understand as truth. We have to listen to Prabhupada. Either read his books or listen to his tapes each day. Read books, yes. Uh, if you're reading his books, yeah. 
Yes, yeah. then more. <laughs> it's a little better. <laughs> I guess I didn't really... I, well, I actually meant what I said, but since you all kind of like got a little nervous, I think so we put the second part. But I like hearing about Prabhupada. When I hear Prabhupada's words, they sort of, you know, resonate. A, a, there's a purity that comes with the knowledge, and that purity gives you realizations. This is, this is a principle that should be understood. By repetition and hearing, the realizations start to manifest. Like, how many times have we heard, you're not this body? I mean, thousands of times. But how, 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 how many of us have actually realized it by, by how do we come to the realization that I'm not this body? Actually got that realization. Realization means to intuitively you know it, not theoretically, but you actually, it resonates with your being. You know, I am not this body. You experience, the knowledge becomes an experience. I was listening to Prabhupada one day, and I, he was saying, you're not this body, and all of a sudden, boom, all the lights went on. I heard it for the first time. I've heard it hundreds of times before, but this time I heard it. So that's the importance of hearing, that when we, we keep hearing, finally we'll get to the point of realizing what we're hearing. What we're hearing. It won't be theory anymore. It will be an, a feature of knowledge. And that knowledge becomes part of you. It's no longer there's you and there's the knowledge. It's actually the knowledge is becomes part of your existence. That's the importance of hearing regularly. So reading is hearing. But I also like the this, this spoken word because there's something very special about the voice that, that uplifts our consciousness and gives us realization. So I would also recommend devotees to every day listen to Prabhupada. You know, I, every time I take breakfast, every morning I turn on Prabhupada. So when I'm eating breakfast, I don't eat with other people and I only listen to Prabhupada. You can come and bother me and I won't talk to you. Because you know? that's my time for listening. Now, I do it at lunch, occasionally when I have the opportunity and I'm more or less by myself. But breakfast is like my time for Prabhupada. So, and I, you know, that's, that's, that's me. That, that, that's actually more important than my breakfast. Because <laughs> that's like nourishment, spiritual nourishment. To hear my spiritual master speaking pure transcendental knowledge his words so powerful just in his voice resonates the purity of this of what he's saying and the words have such power although they may be simple philosophical principles they're deep when it's when it's spoken by a self-realized soul yes Maharaj, uh, regarding this uh, hearing uh not uh, speaking about reading Prabhupada book, this is something that we should do daily. But I'm just asking about hearing, um, I have a tendency to hear my Guru Maharaj because I, I have yeah. this connection with him, I feel this inspiration. So is it okay to hear from, like... You should hear from Prabhupada too. Prabhupada is fading in the background as time goes on. Our movement is losing our, our understanding of what Prabhupada is and what he's given us. He's becoming more like a figure of the past, more like an icon, like a, somebody who started it but is no longer personally present. He's personally present yet through everything we do. Everything that we, everything about our Krishna conscious society is Prabhupada. You can't get away from him. And we have to keep both his teachings and his personality foremost in our life. Therefore, yes, hear from your spiritual master. That is required but also hear from Prabhupada. At least read his books every day. That's important. Otherwise, time goes on and we lose touch with who Prabhupada is and what he gave us and how we can honor what he gave us. Everything is about Prabhupada. You look around, you can't see any, you can't separate anything we do from Prabhupada. It's all about him. 
But we're losing that. Just like in the ILS meeting, Bhakti by Baba Maharaj has taken on the service of uplifting Prabhupada's Vyasa Puja program. Every year we hold Prabhupada's Vyasa Puja the day after Krishna's appearance. And what kind of ceremony do we give Prabhupada? We stay up all night, late till 12 o'clock after. Um, the next morning everybody's tired. We have a little, we throw a few flowers in the morning. We have a push punjali, we eat a feast. That whole day should be honored in, in glorification of the spiritual master with enthusiasm. Our movement is not doing that. So there's a big concern on how to bring Prabhupada's Vyasa Puja program up to standard and invite others to take part in it also. So there's a little bit of a group that's going to try to improve that on a worldwide level. You see, it's maybe we say it's because it's the day after uh, John lost me, everybody's tired. Right? The, the ones who come, they're dragging themselves there, and the other ones don't come because, you know, it's too, you know, they stay up to 2, 1 o'clock in the morning, and then the next morning there's nobody goes to Mongol RT or very few. When it comes to the time for the Vyasa Puja time, at 7 o'clock, there could be much many more devotees there, but because they're up late celebrating John Boston. So you might say, well, let's switch the day. I think that's one of the considerations. But the point, the point is, Prabhupada's not getting what he should be getting. And we're not giving what we would, we would, what we would rather, what would, we, what would we want to give to Prabhupada because for whatever reason. So yeah, because in Prabhupada's fading in the background. The, the ILS took a survey on how many people read Prabhupada's books according to the different types of scriptures. The survey was very poor. 259 people took the survey. It wasn't very much. It was, that was only about one third of the actual persons in, who were there for the meetings. But out of the 259, the average reading of Prabhupada's books was low, very low, extremely low. So low that it was ridiculous. And these were leaders. Less than, it was 0.92% of Chaitanya Chari can read that. So the average was that, not a, the average wasn't even one, a person doesn't have, an, hasn't even read Chaitanya Chari can read it once in their life once. Bhagavad Gita wasn't much better. Nectar devotion was the, practically the same. We don't read Prabhupada's books. We don't study them. We don't know them. We don't preach them. We have a few people doing it, but as a society, we're very poor in our relationship with understanding what Prabhupada's giving us and giving that information to others. So there's, uh, there's an initiative to try to bring Prabhupada more foremost through study of his books and hearing more and more about what he wants us to do as a society. He gave us everything. It's all there. We just have to understand it. Yes? Yeah? I don't want to sound like I'm chastising you. If it sounds like that, I'm not. I'm just making, just making the point of, you know, as a society, we need to really come back to Prabhupada as an organization. And we're getting away from it. Um, I just want to ask you if you could uh, mention uh, the importance of Sri Prabhupada's mission in order of uh, Vanupedia. Because Vanupedia. Vanupedia. That's great, yeah. You can Vanupedia speak something. Vanupedia is a wonderful program to make everything Prabhupada said, wrote, uh, available. What is it? Do you have the website? Do you know that? Yes, uh, I'm yeah, also, we'll give that to uh, Vishnu Priya Mataji and she can post that. Anything you want to know about the philosophy that was said by Prabhupada is available in categories, right? You can find it, and they have different means to find different topics and ideas 
it's a it's a great great program for bringing Prabhupada's books. That's good. okay. So Japa, Prabhupada, and Bhaktisvara. Then the last thing is a very practical thing that I should the devotees should listen to this. This is pretty much for disciples. Before one can actually, it, it's so important that we understand the process of initiation. And now the GBC has made the, the standards for initiation a little higher. So anyone who is aspiring for initiation must take what is called the disciples course. Krishna Priya, can you speak a little bit about the disciples oh, course? No, I'm not expert for disciples. Does anybody have some knowledge of what this disciples course is? Manjari Gopi was here. Manjari Gopi, she's, yeah, she's she was uh, she's at the, she's the a kid's time. Yeah. But there is a, a course now called the disciples course that it's re it's a requirement for initiation. First thing, yes. Four days. Four days, and uh, actually they are uh, talking about uh, the uh, importance uh, and uh, the, uh, the guru, the relationship with the guru. And, uh, I think it needs, it, it, there's some effort to expand the information within the course. Anyway, anyone who is aspiring for initiation must take the disciples course. Anyone who is aspiring for second initiation must have Bhakti Shastra. That's now a GBC rule. <coughs> Someone in one of Prabhupada's early disciples asked Prabhupada, how important is second initiation? Can you go back home, back to Godhead without second initiation? Prabhupada said, no, you have to have second initiation. Actually, the process of initiation is one. First and second has been created within the last two acharyas just to make the process more available. So there was only, at Tori Bhakti Vinota course time, there was only Brahminical initiation. Initiation means Brahmin, that's all. Bhakti Siddhanta broke it into two Harinam and Brahminical initiation to give people an opportunity to come up to the standard. And so we have first and second initiation, but the real initiation is Brahman initiation. So those of you who have taken first initiation, you should see what, it, what it need, you need to do in order to qualify yourself for that second initiation. What are some of the things you can do? Is one is learn the qualities of a Brahman. What are the qualities of a Brahman is mentioned in the Shastras and cultivate those qualities, practice them more and more, and also to learn Prabhupada's books. Bhakti Shastra is accreditations in the knowledge of Bhagavad Gita, nectar of devotion. Um, uh, what else? We have to, no. we have to instructions. Sri Upanishads. Yeah. These four books. Which are, I mean, it's really not much. Now, the next one is Bhakti Vai Bhava. Includes those four plus the first six cantos of Srimad Bhagavatam. Higher than that is Bhakti Vedanta, which is the entire Srimad Bhagavatam. And Bhakti Sarvabhoma is the highest. Prabhupada in 1974 instituted this educational system. It's only recently we're actually formalized it in a form of study in Vrindavan and in Mayapur and a few other places now. But Prabhupada wanted each and every devotee to learn his books. When you have that knowledge, you're fixed. No one can deviate you. When, you're, when you know the philosophy, you're fixed. The problem is we don't know it, or we don't know it enough to understand how to apply it. 
we were hearing from Bhuta Bhavana, from Bhutan Dasma, he has a very interesting quality. He can explain it and also give you the understanding of how to apply it. The application is just as important as the knowledge. And the application brings about realization of the knowledge. And when you get realization, you're, you're, you have successfully understood. So, uh, yeah. So these courses that are being available, Bhakti Shastra, are foundational for our spiritual growth. But as a requirement, Bhakti Shastra is required. So those of you who have taken first initiation, and some of you have taken first initiations four, five, six, seven years ago, you should look towards taking second initiation and becoming qualified by taking the Bhakti Shastra course and also reading about and cultivating the qualities of Brahminical services like that. That's important. Any questions on that? I just want to tell everyone that everything about initiations are on the web page, Guru Maharaj's web page. I think there is also a link about the disciple course. So. Yeah, Vishnu Priya Mataji is saying everything about initiation is on the conference. Those of you who are not on the conference, you can just no, no, write to me. On the web page, your web page. Oh, it's on the web page. Yes. It's not on the conference. Sometimes you put also on the conference, but there is always available on... So the web page is, what's the... cmswami.com cmswami.com, you go there, you can find all the requirements for initiation, and also a link for the Disciples course. It's important. Yes. Well, you mentioned by Prabhupada that you can't go back to Godhead if you only have... Prabhupada said that. Is that like a definitive statement, or was he saying it to... He answered that question. I actually posted that statement on my conference a few times just to show them how important it is to take second initiation. He, Prabhupada said, second initiation is the real initiation. Well, a Harinam initiation is preliminary. It's not, it's not complete. If you look toward, you should look toward second initiation. Everybody looks quite morose. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, the movie is at the end. So. <laughs> and then there's Prashadam after that. Yes, Varsana. services and others don't really need it. No, no, it's not true according to Prabhupada's statement. It's required for second initiation. I think there's a couple statements. Courses available. I think there's courses also online that you can take. But the struggle is they just don't have the adhikari for study. Is that it? We just don't have. 
Well, I, I just, for me, I see it as that people just don't put these things as important. We have a tendency to see success in what we do as opposed to what we know. You know, doing is important, and that's, yeah. But if we're always just doing and not taking time for hearing and chanting, sufficient time, and then after a while we'll lose that, you know, what we say, that understanding of what is the purpose of what we're doing. And then when challenges and obstacles and even reverses in life come up, we're not equipped to handle them because we just don't have the understanding. The knowledge is both a protector and it's also an inspiration. It's also a means to know Krishna. <laughs> we have to hear about Krishna, his pastimes, his activities. I think we everyone has to make an effort to see what they need to do to somehow or other become more and more involved with studying Prabhupada's books. That's an instruction. Prabhupada not only said, read my books, he said, no, study them. Okay. Even some other movements criticize us. They say, you know, your devotees are, they don't know anything. <laughs> and many, there's many people who left our movement because they didn't feel there was enough emphasis on Shastra and study. Mm -hmm. We need a balance like that. It's important. It is so, this is such a satisfaction in hearing and reading Prabhupada's books. It's an inner, inner peace and an inner inspiration that develops. For me, when I read, it increases the quality of my japa. My japa is enhanced through my reading. So I, I actually see that. That's not something I sense, it's something I actually experience. When I, the more I read, the better my job is. We just have to do it. <laughs> okay, and the last thing was for receiving initiation, either first or second, Recommendations come from senior devotees in the area you're in. And that generally is the temple president or some person who is designated to be, uh, what we say, your mentor. In other words, everyone should work under the guidance of someone they can get help from and check in every once in a while and see how they're doing, ask questions. Spiritual master cannot deal with all these things because he's not in the same area. So we need local care. So I'm, refer I'm saying it's very important that everyone has a big brother or a big sister. And that person can also nominate and recommend you for the next step in your spiritual life. And it's not hard to find. In every temple, there are senior devotees. And in many cases, the temple president takes on the responsibility also. Someone who, who can recommend you and also guide you in your local area. In other words, we call it a counselor. Uh, this is becoming more and more important in our society because the spiritual master really doesn't know how his devotees are doing. He's wondering. How are they doing? What do they need? Sometimes they, they don't write. So but if he can reference through their counselor, then, then both of them together can work together to help the aspiring disciple like that. So that's important, that everyone have a big brother, a big sister, some guide on a local level. That's not hard. You can just ask someone to do that and you'll find devotees want to do that. Yeah, I'll, I'll help you. Come to me. We can discuss the philosophy and we can also report to them. It's important. Now, if you're living as a grihast in the family life, you can also, both of you together can have one person who is your big brother or big sister. Like that. Everyone should have that. That's important. Otherwise, how do we know how you're doing? 
How's she doing? I don't know. Haven't heard for five months. <laughs> she chanting her, I don't know. You know, it's just like it's become so distant. But the thing is, the duty of a spiritual master, foremost duty, is to make sure that the, his disciples are getting what they need to make spiritual advancement. If he doesn't do that, he's neglecting his responsibility as a spiritual master. So due to our, what we say, global society, it's not practical to always be in communication. So we have to set in place those persons who can help one's disciples in the local area. And so that's actually a system that's developing on a broader level, but each and every one should be part of that system, or in such a way that they have someone that they can go to and guide, get guidance from, and be accountable to also. Everybody's cheering. Oh, okay. <laughs> Another long face on that one. <laughs> Any, were you just think, thinking about what I'm saying? Any response? Does it make sense? Should we, does it, are you enthusiastic to try it? Yeah. Well, we have, just like we have Somadatri. She's a counselor. She has how many people you work, who work under you? Eight. So she's responsible to take care of eight people in Slovenia. So why can't we have that in other places? That's a lot for one person, for eight persons. So eight persons come to her. When they write to me and complain to me about what their problems are, I usually refer them to her. And I either ask her or I refer them to her for solutions to their situation. She's a big help. Without her help, I couldn't, you know, do what I'm doing with the persons that who come to me for initiation. It's essential that the spiritual master has that kind of, you know, support in the local area for his disciples. It could come from the TP, or it could come from just an advanced senior divine. Yes. Can we receive an instruction from the spiritual master through the mentor? Yeah. yeah. He actually, the mentor, the mentor's entrusted with the responsibility of taking care. So the spiritual master doesn't always tell the mentor what to do. He gives them the responsibility to help the disciple. And ladies should have lady mentors and men, men. A couple can have either one if they come together. You know, how, how do I know when someone's ready for initiation? I don't know. <laughs> and then if the mentor says, sends me a letter, Maharaj, or I want to recommend this person for a second, yeah, fine. Well, I'll just take it. I won't even question it. I might, I might ask one or two. No, I won't even question it because I, the responsibility is already given. I think you have that system in Soho Street, right? Yeah, Soho Street is, uh, is strong on that, you know? A whole system of mentors. But I see, and especially with my disciples, is a lot of people who are kind of disconnected from a lot of things. And they don't have any shelter other than whatever they create. So it's good, it's, it's recommended highly to have a mentor. Counselor, God. Any other statements on that? You want to say something, Somadatri, in relationship to that? What does it entail in terms of responsibility? To make sure they're chanting their 16 rounds. Yes, uh, 16 rounds and then uh, the reading. reading they're reading regularly. Uh, yeah. If they have problems, they come to you. Uh, and, uh, in my group, uh, uh, we most uh, solve uh, this uh, problem, life 
Mm-hmm. Day to day we struggle. So. Uh, it's no so much uh, spiritual. Yes, uh, the same, uh, but uh, it's uh, very, very much uh, this day to day. Yeah, it's the day to day challenges that we get, maybe even with our families, day to day activities outside with, with work. Uh, uh, sometimes she always knows, she has a feeling. Yeah. So you're one of her counselees, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, sometimes uh, I, uh, I say that uh, I only uh, keep them under the water, mm-hmm. uh, not, to, not to sink, mm-hmm. keep them yeah. under the water. Yeah, you can keep them going <laughs> till they come to the disciples' meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Keep them floating, even though they're not swimming, at least they're floating. <laughs> so it's important. I think in Hungary, Hungary also, yes, there's a mentor system. stages that the way making the next step means taking advice from those you're working with so I'm the details and how it works is being worked out on the local level but when it's not formalized like Hungary is formalized Soho streets formalized in Ljubljana it's somewhat formalized but when there's, a, there's devotees who are not connected with any of this, you should see, well, I have to find somebody to work with, to work with. In Russia, Ukraine, it's, the system is highly functional. And because of that, devotees are becoming educated and reaching many higher standards of them spiritual practice. So it's really important. It's just a feature of our society. We're so global that we have to have local support on an individual basis. Okay. So I recommend, not recommend, I'd say do it. (laughs) And everyone should find a counselor for their help. My big brother. Yes. If I can add something, we really have uh, older brother and sister in our God family, and we also have to uh, connect with them. If I have some problem with computer, I will call my <laughs> older God brother. No, so I think it's also we have to be more connected our God family. It's, it's also yeah, it's a source of res- uh, getting resources. If you do, if you have some skills and something, you, you can help me, and I can help you like that. So through communication, we learn how to access different types of services and support. Okay. And see, this is a feature of our society that's been a problem: is that devotees come in and they don't get cared for; they just get engaged in services, and then after some time, they they lose their, they didn't, because they didn't get what they need, could have got, they somehow or other become less involved, or sometimes not even involved. So we need this. Bring them in and keep them in. <laughs> not just bring them in, okay, we lost another one, let's bring another one in to replace that one. No, each devotee is so valuable that they, if we don't give them the proper care and guidance, that they are required when they come to to take up spiritual life, we're negligent on that part. But on the 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 individuals have to make an effort also to find that connection too. Yes. Marat, in America, we, as Vishnu Priya was saying, we are so disconnected. 
it because of the distance that maybe it would be worthwhile to have a decide to get together in America also. In, in <laughs> next year? Yeah, we could have two, one in Europe and one in America. That means I have to be in both places. <laughs> I'm not against that. The only problem is that you know, I don't need two meetings, huh? Because I find that, you know, many people can't always afford travel long distance. So we've been having it in the Balkans every year because most of the disciples are there. But this year we had it in London. Hopefully, we I thought I would find a middle road where the Europeans can come and the Americans can come, and London would be the central. So, to some degree, it worked, but it could have been better, I think. Could have got more persons from the U.S. I think you were the only one, right? For whatever reason. <laughs> but that's, a, that's an idea. That's a good idea. But it takes a lot. If you speak to Guru Bhakti, she can explain to you how, how much time, effort, energy, and finances went into organizing this. It wasn't a small thing. Maybe in India is better. In India? Yes, yeah, so nobody can come here. Yes, uh, 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 after Kartik. After Kartik. Well. What we could do is just make it a make it a rule that everyone goes to go, uh, to Gaur Purnima festival in Mayapur, and right after that. Uh, Haribo. 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 And that's Prabhupada's instruction. He said each and every devotee should come to Mayapur for eight days during the Gaur Purnima festival. It's an exact quote. See, I mean, that's how much we know about Prabhupada. <laughs> He says so many things, and we're just hearing it for the first time. You know? <laughs> he said, "Go to Gorpur, go to Gorpurnima festival every year for at least eight days." He said eight days. He didn't say nine, seven. <laughs> he said <laughs> at least eight days. These are Prabhupada's instructions, because he said this is a chance to come to the, the headquarters of our movement. My he said is our headquarters. He made one statement. He said, here we are in Alachua, Florida. No, is it Gainesville, Florida? Gainesville, Florida. So far away from Sri Mayapur, the center of the world. <laughs> so the Americans think everything that America is the center, you know. <laughs> Americans think, well, here we are, we're in the center. The problem is no, Mayapur is the center. <laughs> So he wanted everyone to come as a family. This year we had a, an influx of thousands of Chinese, not thousands, but hundreds and hundreds of Chinese devotees who came for the, the, the uh, Gokwanyu festival. So many Chinese there this year. Every year the Russians are there, 1,000, 2,000 Russians, 3,000. The Russians are so big that they have their own yatra during the, the Mandala Parka. The, the so I don't know what's wrong with America. I'm lazy. I can't even find Americans anymore. The only Americans are there are Prabhupada disciples who have been in the movement for 30 years and have to come because of duty. Americans don't come. They don't come to my floor. I don't know why Prabhupada started the movement in America. There's a few, but in proportion, it's you know, Chinese are there, the Russians are there, Bengalis and others. You have to, it doesn't take much, once a year, save your money, you know, go to Mayapur for Gorpurina. Especially if the disciples meeting is there after them. That would work, if everyone can. Okay, so, I wanted to cover these points, and now we'll, we don't have much time left. This is a beautiful, wonderful video. This was put together by the Iskana Society. It's about, it's called 50 years in this time. So, is everything in, ready to go? Make sure the voice is also working. 
Okay, well, let's see. I think you can. As soon as it starts, you can hit the lights. Here we are, 26 Second Avenue. Very few New Yorkers know the historical significance of this humble storefront. See the sign behind me? It says Maxwell's Gifts. It was the name of a curio shop that was here in the mid-60s. A name that turned out to be quite prophetic indeed. It's here where an ancient Eastern spiritual tradition took root and expanded throughout the world. This is where it all began. The very first Hare Krishna temple in the West. Take a look around. You can see how small it is. The Swami would come and sit on this end and lecture on the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. Although the Hindu Vaishnava tradition, also known as Krishna consciousness, goes back thousands of years and still has millions of followers in India, it was a very new thing in the West. So Bhaktivedanta Swami decided to incorporate his fledgling movement. And that happened in July. 1966. He founded the movement as ISKCON, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. When Srila Prabhupada came to this country, uh, he did something that uh, was quite uh, daring in the sense that his goal was to transplant a very well-established and very authentic and old tradition from India to the United States, to New York City, to the 60s counterculture. I mean, if you look at it comparatively, there couldn't be two more different cultures than these two. Within 12 short years after he left India, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada traveled across the globe 14 times, initiated thousands of disciples, established over 100 centers, several farm communities, as well as various charity and educational organizations. But what happened to his legacy after he passed in 1977? Where does his organization stand now, five decades after he established it? October 9, 1966, that A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada held the first recorded outdoor chanting session of the Hare Krishna Mantra outside of the Indian subcontinent. Chanting the Hare Krishna Mantra is one of the most important activities for Krishna devotees. goes out every day and that um, goes it's generally two to three hours people from so many countries come here so you can sing to all over the world when you come here on Harinam <laughs> specifically do kirtan.
after years of planting seeds in the West, Prabhupada returned to India and with the help of his American and Indian disciples, started building beautiful temples in the major cities and holy places there. One of his main projects was to build a spiritual city in Mayapur on the banks of the river Ganges. that was far bigger than it ever had been attempted by anyone else. A temple like this has never been built for hundreds of years. We want to make this like a gem. This temple, the Temple of Vedic Territorium, can unite the whole world and establish the peace and prosperity all over the world. Well, Mayapur is the home for all the bodies. I was born and brought up in England. I was born in Cape Town, South Africa. I was born in Detroit, Michigan, in America. I'm from Brazil. I was born in Bengal. My wife, my producer, is from Ukraine. I originally come from China. We actually had a, a visitor here once from the UN. And he said, wow, this really is the United Nations here. <laughs> It's amazing how people can understand each other, although they're so different. We have a oneness on the spiritual platform, and at the same time we recognize the differences, there's variety as well. Mayapur is just a happy place. 